As strange as it may sound, you look forward to recession because you realize that it could be one of your greatest market opportunities. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears and I'm joined here today by my co-host, Ryan Willard. Ryan, how are you today? I'm very well, Enoch. Excellent. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a more profitable and impactful architecture practice that helps you do your best work more often. Now, before we jump into today's conversation, if you haven't already signed up or watched our 60-minute firm owner masterclass on the Smart Practice Method, make sure you do that by heading over to smartpracticemethod.com. Today, we're going to be talking about something that is on the hearts and minds of architects around the world. We know it's a cyclical industry. And so the big question today that we're going to deal with is, what do you do? What strategies can you take with the potential market slowdown? So we have some resources here. This is spawned by certainly some tremors in the marketplace. It's uh, There was a call that we held, a, a roundtable with our clients to feel them out for what they were experiencing in the different industries they're a part of. You know, we work with firms in the restaurant industry, the hospitality industry, custom residential, multifamily government, so a lot of different sectors. And what we're going to discuss today is some of the problems that were coming up that firms are starting to see at this stage in time. But I also want to share a little bit here about a, a very good article that was sent to me by uh, Fundrise. So the CEO of Fundrise, Fundrise is a, uh, it's a real estate investment trust, consumer focused. So this means that anyone can invest in this real estate trust here in the United States. And what it does is it aggregates funding and then they go out and they buy different real estate transactions and properties. They've been doing this for over, over 10 years. Now what's interesting is because of that, they really have their finger on the on the pulse of what the economy is doing as it regards real estate and investments and things like that. So I'm going to read a little bit here about what they had said in this article, because if your question is, are we headed towards a recession? How close are we to a recession? When is the proverbial uh, excrement going to hit the fan? Then we'll take a look at that, right? So first of all, they shared a they shared a, a quote by Jeremy Grantham on Charlie Rose. He's a renowned value investor who famously lost half of his investor base after refusing to buy into the tech bubble in the late 90s, but was ultimately proven correct when the NASDAQ fell by nearly 80%. So he said, there's an enormous pressure in the investment business to deliver good news. Trust me, good news sells better. Stockbrokers thrive on it. Investment houses thrive on it. To go out there in a bubble and talk about overly priced markets uh, and unwise risks is an invitation to get fired. They simply don't want to hear it. So this is something to be aware of if we're leaning on the mainstream media for their pro prognostications about what's happening in the economy. Uh, we, we need to take that with a, a grain of salt. And in the article, they go on to highlight two theories when it comes to um, market forces and the prediction that might have come along with it. So the first and more common goes something like this. While rising interest rates have slowed things a bit, which is what's currently happening here in the U.S., the economy is generally healthy and more resilient than many expected, and ultimately inflation is coming down. So eventually the Fed will begin lowering rates and we will see either a soft landing or potentially a mild slowdown. But actually things are overall pretty good. Now, the second theory, which is their stated opinion, goes something more like this. The effects of rising rates have yet to really start impacting things. It's not that the economy is strong so much as it just takes a long time for these things to play out. The current period of seemingly little impact has created a false sense of confidence. And like a dam that is structurally flawed, the pressure is building, but most will not realize anything is wrong until that final tipping point when the pressure ultimately becomes too great and the dam breaks. And so they go on in this article to correlate and they have graphs from previous slowdowns in the recessions. And they show how historically when interest rates begin to rise, typically there's about a almost a three-year cycle to when the impacts of those rising interest rates really hit the economy uh, and we hit a stock market bottom. So something to be aware of. We'll certainly put this article in the notes. But the question you're probably wondering is whether or not there's going to be a slowdown or not, we like to follow the stoic philosophy, which is focus on the things you can control and accept what you can't. In other words, if the economy slows down, if there's a if there's a, the stock market bottoms out, if our clients run out of money, if the jobs dry up, well, that's just what's going to happen. The question is, what's within our power? What can we do? And to actually be able to answer that question, first of all, we need to be aware of what are the challenges or what are the problems that we are facing here. And so this is where Ryan will, will lead us out because Ryan was the one who led that call with our clients uh, this past Friday, as a matter of fact. And so we're going to give you some 
uh, from our own clients' mouths, firm owners who are currently running small practices of anywhere from zero to 20 people, what they're experiencing in terms of the problems that they're currently seeing. It was um, a very interesting, you know, last week was actually very interesting because a number of clients, usually who had very sturdy pipelines, some of whom as well in the historically in the past have been very good at closing deals and, you know, they've been trained with us and they've, they've got a good sales patter. They were starting to notice a slowdown or a kind of hesitancy or at least the need for more energy to be put into their marketing and sales um, and that some clients were actually taking a lot longer to convert um, you know there was more inquiries perhaps but then things were not kind of being moved over the line um, and that was you know I had about eight or nine different individual conversations with people which is it was enough for us to kind of get together and go right okay this is a this is a, a trend that must is a, is emerging out of our small kind of uh, data set of of clients, um, which led to this larger round table. And it, I thought it was quite interesting because the things I'm going to share here were actually basically you know people's direct experiences of what they've been seeing and happening to the in their own businesses over the last six weeks, two months. Um, so the first thing was there's been a lot of projects that have been put on hold and a lot of projects that have been indefinitely put on hold. And this is happening right across uh, n- numerous sectors. So even the high net worth, the ultra high net worth sectors, which usually are pretty well insulated against any kind of um, economic troubles. Um, there's just been a slowdown in terms of decision making. And it could be because there's, you know, rising construction costs there's a lot of fear-mongering uh marketing from other professionals as well saying that this is a terrible time to go ahead with your with your business i think a lot of our clients were not necessarily agreeing with that that advice sometimes when there's a a sort of warm-up to a recession if you like um investors people with a high net worth often are kind of monitoring what's happening market wise because they want to wait for the crash because when th- when a crash does happen or when there's a big price dip then there tends to be you know it's effectively everything goes on sale those people who have got the, the kind of the, the the reserves in the bucket so it might mean that architectural projects um, actually get um, withheld some people were some clients were actually sh- um, sharing that they had quite honest and open conversations with their clients and you know, um, some of their, even some of their high net worth clients were actually uncertain, certainly the ones who were employed as opposed to ones who were business owners, um, you know, very, very well high paid employees, um, um, you know, tech directors and C-level executives, they were actually becoming nervous about their own employment. Um, and you know, their new stuff was happening and they just wanted to slow down their going ahead with a project just in case they didn't have a job in, in, in six months' time. Now, uh, that, that, that's interesting in and of itself, and I, I think a little bit of a, it kind of points towards having these financial conversations with clients really, really early on. So that you, as being a, you know, part of your own due diligence, you know, get more comfortable talking about the finances of, uh, of a client's position, what their financial cycles are, how they're planning to actually pay for the for the costs of the design team and the consultants, how they're planning to pay for the construction costs. These are all perfectly legitimate conversations to have. And the more um, the more skill and financial fluency that you have, the more useful and valuable these conversations can be for both you and for the client. But uh, I, mu- I must say, you know, we talk to a lot of architects and you know, certainly not once they've become BOA clients, but certainly in the in the early stages or you know when we're when we're talking in the industry that lots of architects shy away from having these financial conversations with their clients and 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 don't do much due diligence so I, i'd put that in a as a kind of problem as well is that there is there is a lack of due diligence that happens when screening your own clients 
And one thing to add to that, Ryan, is that, and perhaps our listeners can identify with this, when a client comes to you, uh, it's not uncommon for a client to maybe over-exaggerate their financial strength or over-exaggerate their desire to get this project done. Uh, Think about it, you, the listener who's listening to this right now. Have you ever been involved in a purchase where uh, you wanted to show up as interested as possible because you wanted to get the person selling to give you as much information as possible? So a quick example of this back... This must have been 15 years ago. My wife and I were looking for a sailboat. So we lived on a sailboat in Houston for approximately eight years while our young kids were growing up. And so we had gotten to the stage where we had a couple kids. And guess what? The little sailboat we were on, a little buck under 25, we needed to upgrade it. And so we went shopping for a sailboat. And I remember that a yacht broker took us out on this beautiful English boat called the Westerly. Uh, They have a very particular design because they have two keels that come down. It's that part that comes down to the bottom. But they're designed, they're one of the only boats that design, a sailboat that's designed when the tide goes out. So large tide fluctuations that happen in around the English coast allows these boats to settle um, flat on the ground. Anyways, very nice boat. But I, I specifically remember... Uh, knowing that the boat was a little bit past our price range, but then wanting to take it out for a sale and then just kind of posturing as if we had the financial ability to purchase this boat when it really would have been a stretch for us. And it, you know, looking back, it certainly wasn't very authentic of me to have done that, but it definitely helps me understand where our clients are coming from. And so you need to understand this as an architect that when you're getting that call from a developer, someone who has a project, they're going to want to pretend like the project is a, a green, all green lights ahead, a full steam ahead. And if you, if you, if you buy that, a hook, line, and sinker. In other words, if you trust that that's the case without slowing it down, without doing some proper due diligence, then you can find yourself experiencing some of the other problems that we're going to be talking about here, which is like uh, ghosting clients, sitting out a proposal, and then they wait a long time to actually make a decision. Then you're in the limbo of figuring out, do I have this project? Do I not? A lot of these things can be stopped up front by having a very frank conversation with your clients about their financial strength and actually positioning this conversation as a consultation, meaning that you want to help them pull this product off. So would it make sense for us to look at the impacts of an impending recession, how this might influence the business sense of proceeding with the project such as this? Absolutely. I mean, and, you know, just being able to have the ability to speak finance with your clients and not be phased by it and not shy away from these, these conversations, it's massively valuable for the other person. You know, we, we see in the I know you, in the US, you guys have got kind of client rep services. And in the UK, there's these kinds of um, concierge type services for high net worth individuals. And there's certainly specialist concierge services for property, where there'll be a single point of contact for a high net worth individual. And this concierge service will work out their finance for them and help them then find a piece of land and then do negotiations around the the acquisitions and then you know and then it will then they'll go and assemble the kind of construction team um and the kind of you know the engineers and the architects and then they'll go and even offer um you know post occupancy services from from maintenance to you know further renovations to interior design uh, services to artwork curation and it's really fascinating because it's okay great well then there there you go those here's a here's a position that a company who doesn't have any architectural expertise is really curating the whole um, the whole project, and they're in a very powerful position with that with that person. And it really starts at that beginning point where they're bringing value by questioning and asking and actually being an ally to the client in terms of their finance. And if we, when we think about it, um, being an ally to our clients and understanding what their financial problems and their cycles are, it's just a massive opportunity to be able to bring more value more value and bring more and, and um, you know, have higher fees as a result. You know, when, again, I, I think a problem that we see so much in the architecture industry is that we have this conversation of we need to be able to communicate our value better, but we never take the time to understand, well, what does value mean for the other person? What is actually valuable right now for, for that person? Before we start talking about us and ourselves, what's valuable for the for the client so these financial conversations you know it opens doors and it certainly will have your clients listen in a listen to you in a very very different different way and you know it's part of your due diligence really it's part of your risk assessment 
do I want to be getting involved with these with these people? You know, many estate agents, they'll ask for proof of funds from certain clients. Or if you're applying for a mortgage, just consider the 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 kind of lengthy documents and application process that a mortgage broker will go through to ensure that you, you know to ascertain your your risk to to them lending you something so you know we can start taking a little bit of that and and applying it to these upfront conversations these kind of grown up upfront conversations about about money so it alongside of that what we what we were hearing was again in the world of the ultra high net worth individuals where a lot of these guys were giving pushback to proposals and asking for discounts and negotiating. Um, and I think, again, you know, it's interesting when people say that, that their proposal, somebody asked them to reduce their fees or ask for a discount. Uh, and sometimes you know, an architect might take that very personally, or, you know, I often hear people getting quite upset when somebody's pushed back on their fees. But again, I think we need to be a little bit open-minded here and recognize that for some people, that's what they do. They negotiate. They're, they're almost expecting you as the, as the consultant to have overinflated your price and they're expecting a back and forth bartering. And again, being cognizant and skillful in sales and, and marketing, you should be prepared for this. You should be prepared for this. You should be prepared to have these types of conversations and have a handful of different um, kind of responses, rebuttals and strategies. And certainly people in the, you know, who are very financially fluent and successful in business, they're going to negotiate. That's how, you know, they're, they're business people. So you need to you know, learn to be prepared for these kinds of conversations. In, interestingly, um, a little side story, my partner, Yvonne, many years ago, she used to work in a one of the be most beautiful hotels in London, the Corinthia, really kind of classy hotel. We went there, actually, Enoch, and had tea, if you remember when you came to London. Very, very nice um, place. And uh, she said that it was very interesting because the, the people who worked on the desk could always tell who was who was there as a sort of middle class person who was taking themselves out for a birthday treat or for or for some sort of special occasion because they were normally they they turn up the hotel and they were right on time for their check in and they were all dressed up in kind of you know their their Sunday bests and they would never question anything and they would you know they would pay the bills and all that kind of stuff and you know, they typically weren't there for that for that long. And but she said the the super rich people would often come in. It's a bit diff more difficult to tell who was who. They weren't necessarily so so flashy all the time. But often they would always ask for discounts. Always ask for discounts. Even in the hotel. They would say, Well, we're staying here, we're staying here for two weeks. Is that the best price you can do? And guess what the hotel did? Gave them the discounts. <laughs> right? So the hotel didn't quite know what to do with it, but they would often, they, they had their own sort of little, little dance move that they would do of upselling and, you know, kind of going back and forth. And they had their own way of preparing for it. And, you know, well, we're going to take a little, if we discount, then we're going to, you're going to lose this sort of, this, this sort of thing. Or, you know, they would be like, okay, they, they, they were prepared for it. And they had whatever, you know, the, the, they weren't salespeople necessarily on the desk, but there was a kind of a series of strategies to be able to prepare for that. And I thought that was very interesting that, that, that the very, very wealthy people were just, that was a pattern for them, just to ask for, um, to ask for, uh, for, for, for a discount. So I think there's that famous story that was going around on the internet a little while back where Oprah was out and about in a restaurant somewhere and she had her whole entourage of about 25 people and she was in a big, uh, you know, Michelin star restaurant, and um, the bill, the, the the bill came, and one of her kind of assistants came came to the uh, to the kind of concierge desk and and said very politely, "Thank you so much for the bill. Um, we're here with Oprah. Oprah doesn't pay." <laughs> Really? <laughs> what? I haven't heard this before. This is no way. Now, with with, with this, this 
with this particular restaurant, the the, the kind of uh, head chef or whoever it was actually went out himself and took the receipt to Oprah and slammed it down on the desk and said, Oprah pays. Okay. But what it, what it indicated was that obviously that's a behavior that, you know, happens quite a lot because they were used to going into places where they wouldn't pay. And I, and I would, and I would assert that it wasn't anything necessarily underhand or nasty, but Oprah is very, very famous. And there's an enormous amount of value that you will get as a restaurant having her eat at your restaurant and she knows it. Okay, I'm not saying this is a bad thing. This is just like she knows her worth and she knows the ability of one tweet, one good word brings in an enormous amount of, of, of value. But this, this business, they were very prepared for that and stood their ground and said, no, Oprah pays and she paid without any, without any hesitation. And then the, the story was made out into the internet and maybe, maybe evolved into something else that it wasn't quite, but Either either way, it's a it, it's a it's a good illustration of just for us as as vendors of professional services and people who are allies to our clients to be prepared with their ways of negotiating and how they're kind of what 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 they're looking for in terms of exchange of value. So so th again, so this is one thing that people have been seeing more of that there's been more of this type of negotiation that's been happening um in the last in the last few months um we've seen obviously interest rates have gone up there's more perhaps more unemployment um i think this was from somebody in canada that was saying that uh, in in canada there's been a lot more union activity and a lot more strike action i don't know if that's the case is that the case in north america as well in it in, in, in the u.s mm, i i wouldn't say so i but uh, Certainly, there has been some strikes happening in Hollywood that have made the news, um, but I haven't I haven't heard any recession based. Although certainly this is something to look out for because certainly when companies start making layoffs, they start making austerity adjustments, start spending less, um, start spending less money. Layoffs can start to happen. Unions can start to mobilize. So this is something that could easily gridlock one of your clients, for instance, or a project that maybe gets in the in the firing range of these things, for instance. Um, now, this is unrelated to the economy, but certainly this could impact one of your projects. I have one of our clients that had a large hotel project, a hospitality, very large project for them. They were celebrating. This is a great win for us. Um, but what ended up happening is that the roads that lead up to access this particular facility where the property is were impacted by some rainstorms that had happened uh, here in California over the past uh, springtime. And so the roads still haven't been prepared. So this project's getting pushed out indefinitely. So just to bring that up to say, certainly there can be things like strikes. Certainly there can be things like economic slowdown. But at the same time, there can be other unforeseen circumstances like fires, acts of God, uh, acts of nature that, that can impact your clients' projects as well, but yep. I haven't I haven't heard too many uh, along the um, along the strike front here in the U.S. Got other it. than the the well known Hollywood yeah, Writers Guild, true. which is in, in a whole nother Bad. conversation about AI and 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 compensation for writers and disruptions there. But that's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> so um, there's I mean and there's been unemployment in um, in the tech in the tech world. So we have seen large tech com tech companies letting Certainly. go. Of of, yeah, um, Silicon Valley Bank, which was, uh, um, again, another podcast episode could be around this. One of the largest holders of that cryptocurrency companies were using to hold their holdings um, was basically seized, but basically failed. The bank failed. Um, and so there's a lot of talk about that bank being targeted to target the cryptocurrency company. But in any case, let's face it, there's a lot happening in the world right now. And this was definitely something to be wary of and has impacted projects that are tied to those markets. Yeah. I mean, again, I mean, it's interesting to, you know, always consider that construction typically has always been like a kind of canary in the mine. It's always been one of these industries that's very, that's very fickle. It's very sensitive to any kind of economic changes. There's always economic uncertainty. I mean, I think that's one thing that, again, just to be prepared for, as business owners of in, in architectural practices, that when is there not when is there not uncertainty in the economy? This is you know this is really these things. This is why it's so important to be prepared to be you know to learn the language of business and the mechanisms for running a healthy, profitable company, 
and to be committed to actually mastering them, the shit always happens. It's like we're living in a in a constantly dynamic, moving economy, and technology is shifting and changing, and you know people get spooked, people start to celebrate. There, it happens in in cycles. So we've got to be able to be, you know, agile in our on our on our mindset and our skill sets in actually making sure that our businesses are able to weather all sorts of different um, storms. So important, yep. and not not to be not to be frozen by fear, because the purpose of this podcast episode isn't to start the tremors of fear. Because what can often happen when we see that maybe things will start going down is we start to get afraid. And what's interesting is if you look at where does that fear and anxiety come from, it comes from a lack of our own ability to navigate the situation. So it always comes back to us. Uh, it reminds me of my recent um, jujitsu practices. So I've been getting into jujitsu since November. I'm not very good, but I certainly enjoy it. Go there and I roll around with a bunch of guys who are a lot younger than me and some ladies as well. And I get <laughs> I get beaten a lot. You know, they they tap me out, they choke me, they you know make me get near passing out. You know, it's a it's a test of pain and endurance. But one thing that I find with jujitsu, which is relevant to this conversation, is we'll practice a move, and this move seems fantastic. It just seems so. I'm like, this is a great move. I'm going to do this. And then I get on the mat with someone to practice the move, but they never. It seems like they don't have the script for how this move is supposed to go. In other words, I'm I'm going on a script of like, okay, I do this, then I do this, and that person does that, and I do that. Well, if they don't do what I expect them to do, suddenly my whole move is off, my whole my whole world collapses, and it doesn't work anymore, right? So going back to what Ryan's talking about, which is the ability to be agile. When we're running a practice, I know we've both run practice in the past, and with our work and clients, it's very easy to want to go back into comfort. This is just a natural part of being a human being, which is when we're comfortable, we just want to relax. We don't want to do any personal development. We just want to continue the status quo. Can't I just continue to wait for the phone to ring and just continue to do things the way that I'm doing them? But the problem with that is that we lose agility. And this is where, you know, we're not paying attention. And then we do one move. We think that's what's going to happen. But, you know, our opponent or the economy or something opens up a different move. We find ourselves in, in an arm bar where our arm's being twisted back in the opposite direction. And then before you know it, we're tapping out and we've gotten ourselves into a world of hurt simply because we weren't agile and we weren't paying attention and we weren't on our feet and we weren't being situational. We were trying to follow a script of something that's worked for us in the past. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so another thing we heard that was happening was we had, um, we've had a number of clients who have had projects exit at quite developed stages. So, you know, after schematic design, um, perhaps in kind of construction detail, CD sets, um, where the clients have just kind of put a hold on the project altogether, or they've exit, exited the project and been like, that's not going to happen. We've heard of clients actually selling their projects. So again, developers have, you know, decided not to go ahead with that, actually taking the risk of building something, but they might have got approvals on it and they change what they've been saying for the last two years and, you know, now they're not going to build it and they're going to they're going to cut their losses and, you know, make a little bit of money by selling uh, a piece of land with that's got, you know, the ability to have 20 units on it or whatever. Um, there's been a lot of concerns over construction costs. I think that's probably the most, you know, we've been hearing this one for the best part of a year and a half now. Um, and it certainly in the I think you know really in the, the kind of lower middle class demographic ADU the world of the ADUs kind of smaller renovation projects um, you know uh, certainly the idea with you know, we've had a number of people who are working working in ADUs and you know it's many times that the project just is financially unfeasible for that particular demographic um, unless there's a real kind of pressing family need um in many cases these these projects aren't you know the construction costs are becoming prohibitive or we're seeing projects that have gone through um schematic design and there's been one kind of costing put out and then slightly more detailed drawings come back and the costings are coming back way off way off and this is again this is causing projects to either go back to the drawing board or be put on hold or cause more strained relationships. Um, we're seeing an uptick in accounts receivables. 
Okay, so late payments. Um, this has been this was the thing that really triggered it for me last week was you know we have a process here at BOA where we have everybody reports their um, their outstanding AR and we like to keep a very close eye on it. Um, you're not allowed to be a client of business of architecture if you are not paying attention to your accounts receivable and what's outstanding and everybody goes through a process of being really really on top of that um, and so when we start to see that you know some people are, are you know the, 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 the time between sending an invoice and getting paid becomes increased or when there's been a few months delay in in payments that's a big that's a big red flag and again you know we've very aware of how prolific this is as a disease in the architecture industry and it's not something to be ignored and it's again this is another another kind of uh point where it just stresses the importance of being able to have those skillful but robust conversations with clients and contractors and whoever it might be ensuring that your contracts are being upheld and that you are getting the money paid to you that you have done the work for i cannot stress this enough like this you know this cannot be ignored it's really really grotesquely irresponsible for any business to be kind of ignoring their outstanding invoices and not taking responsibility for it and just getting into a world of blame so in any kind of market slowdown not unusual to start to see clients taking longer with 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 paying you and this might be a result of all sorts of things and we had a uh, client last week they were saying that some of the international investors from other countries who were bringing money into the US um, had gotten spooked right they'd gotten they'd been reading stuff on the press about what was happening in the US they put a they put a hold on investment and it just put a pause to the entire project and of course all the, there was a kind of knock-on effect right down the consultant chain um we've seen a lot of restaurants we've had a lot of our clients who've been working with restaurants and hospitality um you know that they the, the restaurants have been struggling to get financing um we've heard projects in pipelines where which people were, were certain that they were going to win they've all disappeared um developers taking and you know, coming with very unreasonable time frames, wanting things done super fast, and then proposals being sent out, and then crickets. A um, lot of people, a lot of prospective clients who are just shopping around. So they're kind of doing their their little their little uh, consumer dance of let me talk to this architect, talk to this architect, talk to this architect. Let me get as much information as I I need, and then let's compare prices. And we know that it's very rarely is that comparing apples to apples. Um, people having proposals sat on for longer than usual. A, a, again, you know, this is something that uh, can be dealt with up front and having things like expiry dates on proposals and for starters, just running your proposals face to face with uh, with prospective clients and being able to handle objections in a conversation face to face rather than this kind of email negotiation that ha that happens it's just, that's a very weak way of of doing anything really it's just you know there's just so much space for things to go to go wrong for people not to read for people to misinterpret i, I just think like if you're if you're sending out proposals and not negotiating them face to face this is this is this puts your business at such risk at such such risk um yeah again kind of construction costs making making projects very difficult to complete uh there's longer development times we've seen developers asking clients for more economic opportunities developers are having their own refinancing um options um you know problems rather uh i, I must say on the other on the other side of this there's people who are kicking ass as well, right? There's people who are not experiencing anything. Yeah, it's certainly not all doom and gloom. <laughs> yeah, absolutely I, I, not. You know, we're just we're just kind of these are some of the things that we're that we're hearing happening, and yeah. fortunately, a lot of our clients are very well versed in being able to handle this. 
And, and you might want to consider as you listen to these, try to see if you're experiencing any of these because each of these has very specific impacts as well. So when we look at these things like project stalling out, uh, you not getting a definite yes, basically project in the pipeline disappearing, uh, all these have an impact on the business and not, I mean, let's just start emotionally. So emotionally it can be very stressful uh, and it can be uh, very anxious uh, to be able to, to dealing with this as you're seeing the pipeline evaporate, as you're starting to worry about a pending, especially if you've been through a previous recession, it can take a big mental toll on you as a founder, literally take the joy out of life to where suddenly it becomes all consuming. It's all you can think about. You're not present with your family. Instead of being able to be present outside of work, now it's starting to consume your mind. So we'll talk a bit more about the impacts, but Ryan, were there any other major symptoms that you had seen that our clients had, that our clients are experiencing? No, I, I think that really kind of covers it. You know, there's just a lot of a lot of hesitation, a lot of stalling in the pipeline, things that people thought were certain are not certain. Mm, okay. And what? So let's talk about the impacts. What? How do how do these things potentially impact a a business? Well, there's the kind of loss of revenue. Yep. And loss of revenue impacts absolutely everything worst case you know we start having to let people go we have to start making drastic cutbacks we have to stop paying ourselves. financial goals get postponed derailed yep yep all of this when there's that kind of strain on money you can guarantee that uh, a strain in human relations is shortly to follow. I mean, absolutely. Look, when, when financial pressure, and that's what we're talking about here, is, is financial pressure and uncertainty being put on you as a business owner, this can start to put an enormous stress on a, every single other area of your life. So it's going to put an enormous stress. You may give up exercising because you feel like now you need to put more into the business. You may forego your own salary or cut your own salary because you want to keep the business afloat. So this then delays and postpones your own financial goals. You're putting a hold on that, perhaps even digging yourself into a hole because now you're leveraging credit. This is something that every business owner wants to avoid. So the impacts can be mental. They can be emotional. They can be spiritual. They can be physical. They can certainly affect your own morale as a leader. When when team members start to see this or start to sense this, it can affect their morale. And despite the fact that they're putting on a good face on the outside, like most employees would, at the same time, there may be a voice in the back of their head saying, hey, do I need to look for another opportunity? Because here's here's the truth. When the shit hits the fan, it's every man and woman for themselves. I mean, that's, that's what's going to happen. You know, when it comes down to brass tacks, people are going to be out for themselves. So it's incumbent upon you as a business owner to, number one, recognize the symptoms, and number two, figure out, okay, what are the, the the strategies that I can implement to deal with these, to cope with these things? And what's the possibility? Uh, you know, we kind of talked about the, the pain, the problems. Let's jump over into the possibility of what does it look like when a small practice is well-equipped to weather these things, to where you're not being reactive. But we're going to, we're going to go into we're going to jump into the into the the possibilities now, Ryan. Anything else we need to jump into uh, or major impacts that you feel like we overlooked, other than depleting our finances and losing yeah, team I mean, members? Yeah, it's, it's just and, it's just a loss of happiness and joy in the in the practice and that kind of team morale that kind of just gets zapped. There's just so much mental energy that comes into you know carrying that kind of burden, and you know we were. See, we see things, you know, other, this, is, this is when team members then start making requests. You know, they want to take more time off or they've got anxiety or they need mental health um, support and, and, and things like that. And the team begins to kind of um, dissipate. Uh, the energy. Well, yeah. yeah it's just, there's kind of like a stress that kind of runs through for, for, for everybody, not, not to mention the kind of, you know, mental well-being and the physical well-being that can be impacted by this all right ryan so we've talked about some of the challenges and and some of the the problems that face practices in a recession what, let's jump over and let's look at some of the possibilities what's possible here with the strategies that we'll be talking about today why don't you start with number one on our list there so the recession occurs as an opportunity not a threat oh sorry that was mine 
I'll, I'll let me jump in and I'll take that. Go for it. Okay. So we've talked about the challenges and problems that face architectural practices when running uh, running into a recession. Now we're going to jump over to the possibilities and, and, and say what's possible when you utilize the powerful strategies that we're going to be talking about that you'll discover on this podcast episode. So number one, number one possibility is recession occurs for you as an opportunity, not a threat. So it's a great book uh, that we recommend all of our clients read. It's called The Three Laws of Performance. And one of the laws, the first law of performance, is simply that the results that you get in your life, the actions you take, yep, for those of you watching a video, Ryan's holding it up there to the camera, great book, is directly correlated to how a situation occurs for us. Let me give you a quick example of what I mean by this. So let's say that it's late at night and there's a single woman who's walking to her, her car from the grocery store. She's picked up some late night groceries. No one else is around. There's a, there's a dim street light. And out of the corner of her eye, she sees someone, a dark figure running towards her. Now, normally, let's say that this, this situation occurs to her as some male, malevolent person, a person with ill intent, uh, potentially about to harm her. And so she rushes over to the car and fumbles for her keys. As this person gets closer, she hears him call out, excuse me, ma'am, excuse me, ma'am, you left your cell phone. Right, And it turns out it's the store clerk who's giving her the cell phone. All of a sudden, all the anxiety and panic disappears, and she's very thankful. So what we can see here is that it was simply the way that she perceived the situation that caused either a rise in her blood pressure and a fight-or-flight response or a calm response to the situation. But it was simply the way she perceived the conversation and what was actually happening. And so one of the dangers that we get into when we're running any business, architectural practice, is that the way we perceive things, or in other words, the way things occur to us, have a very real impact on how we respond to these things. And if we see a recession as a threat, then we're going to take, you know, it's very likely that we're going to be acting out of fight or flight response. And the, the terrible and damaging part about this, as if you're a high performer, is when you go into fight or flight, it takes your reasoning ability offline. Not only that, but it even takes your intuition offline to where you're just reacting and acting out of fear instead of a powerful higher level of consciousness. So instead of being able to see connections and opportunities and think from a space of creativity and a space of innovation, now you're trapped in the monkey brain, which is, you know, everyone abandoned ship, you know, cast all the, cast all the ballast overboard, pirates are here, you know, burn the boats. And uh, you can make unwise decisions that end up really harming the practice in the long run. So possibility number one, just to review is, Instead of seeming like a threat, you actually look forward to, as strange as it may sound, you look forward to recession because you realize that it could be one of your greatest market opportunities, which is the ability to thrive during a recession. Number two, and I think that what you've just said there is really very pertinent of being able to actually see the recession as something that's giving you opportunities and that there's, you know, when there is a recession, it means that there's problems. When there are problems for clientele, then that means that there are solutions. And if you can be the one who's providing the solutions, then there's often a fee that you can charge for them. But it means seeing opportunity where there wasn't any before. And that really kind of leans into the second possibility is that you've actually got sound strategies to handle the inevitable ups and downs of the economy. And I think these are are really twofold. One is what you've just said the, is the ability to be able to see opportunities where before other practices are actually seeing desperation and scarcity and doom and gloom. And the, the other one is that you've got the skill sets, that you've got pipeline building skills, that you've got the, you're confident in your ability to be able to market and sell. Um, that you know where your clients are and that you've been you know, diligently building pipeline and you've been diligently creating a, a network. You understand what your market landscape is. You know where there is potential latent projects. You've been doing all of these things before, the, before a recession. So you're confident that they work and that you know that in a recession, then you can apply some of these strategies more you can increase them, you can accelerate them, or you can, any other way that you can figure out to amplify them, fantastic. You can, you can do that. I think a lot of practices uh, really 
underestimate the you know the the, the power of constantly developing pipeline and honing marketing and certainly conversational sales skills um all of that is just left to to chance and actually having sound strategies to be able to deal with the inevitable is very very powerful and again this is kind of uh you know, when the economy is up and doing well this is the time to train and invest in ourselves this is the this is the best time to to kind of really uh you know learn the craft of winning work because there's less there's less risk to it it's very hard to learn these skills when you're hitting a trough and now you haven't done any marketing and selling for the last uh, year and a half or whatever it ever it was and now you're suddenly trying to pull out all the all the stops doesn't help exactly yeah yeah doesn't help now one thing that that might be occurring for our listeners right now as they listen to this especially if you're running a small firm is well Enoch and Ryan that sounds great but I don't have the time to build a pipeline. I don't have the time to nurture my network. I'm already stretched thin as it is. And those things often get pushed off to the end because let's face it, they can be time intensive. Well, then the question then 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 comes up, which is like, this is exactly like, this is a symptom of not charging enough for your architectural fees, right? So the reason why most small practices don't have, most small practice leaders don't have the time to do more networking, to do more business development, to make sure they're building their pipeline is because they just, they, they're, they're not charging enough to be able to allow that in the practice. Well, then the next question comes up is, well, I can't charge more because if I charge more, I'll start losing projects. And then we would ask, well, what strategies do you have in place and skill sets do you have to be able to charge premium fees for your work, even when other architects were offering maybe a similar or slightly less of a service or maybe the same service for a lot less than you're charging. And what we found is that most small practice owners don't have any strategies around this. And so as such, they become uh, victims of the economy instead of being able to be in a powerful position. Now, I do want to recommend, so in terms of sound strategies to handle the, we know that the economy is going to go up and down. It's inevitable. There's going to be these business cycles. And there's opportunity to innovate. Ryan's going to talk a little bit about this. But I did want to point our listeners to uh, an episode that we recorded with Scott Lowe of Studio 5G, 5G Studio Collaborative, which is Business of Architecture episodes 227 and 228. What I loved about this interview with uh, Scott Lowe, they've been in the Architect 50, uh, which is a, a listing and ranking of architectural successful practices put out by uh, Architect Magazine, which is the official publication of the AIA. But they, they have a presence overseas in Asia. And so I think this is a great example of, you know, proactive strategies to diversify, look at other market sectors. How can you diversify what you're doing to be able to put yourself in a place of success when uh, other firms and local work is drying up? Now, possibility number three is you're confident in your skills and abilities to thrive in any market condition. So when we talk about building a pipeline, bringing in work, making sure that you have robust inquiries for your practice. It's very similar. Oftentimes, what we don't realize is this is a skill like any sport that you might acquire. So recently, I picked up jiu-jitsu, and believe me, when I walked on the jiu-jitsu mat, I just got destroyed by even the most elementary and the most novice white belt. And the key here is that oftentimes we can forget that business development, building a network, being able to turn those relationships into work, it's not just information. It's not like we just need to know what to do and then we can go out and turn it on. So this is the danger that small practice owners that we get into when we're running a small practice is we may have read a couple books. We know intellectually, well, I need to talk to people. I need to call people. I need to build these relationships. But we've never actually taken the steps to practice it. And so what ends up happening, it's like I have the, I've watched a lot of YouTube videos on jujitsu, but then I get thrust into a tournament and I just get destroyed because I don't have the actual skill set. There's a very, it's important that we recognize there's a difference between information and the actual embedment and the, the unconscious competence of that information. So when you're confident in your skills and your abilities to thrive in any market condition, this brings you an incredible peace of mind. Uh, the possibility here is that you can capture market share. Uh, you're thriving while many other small practices around you are in emergency road, red flag. Absolutely. You know, when you've got that peace of mind, this is the thing that allows you to, and this is the, the next possibility, this is the thing that allows you to be innovative 
This is the thing that allows you to put creative energies into your architectural designs and your work. And it also allows you to be innovative with ideas for winning more work or innovation in terms of, um, you know, going back to what we're talking about, number two, with these with developing strategies for being able to serve your clients. Um, I'm reminded of a, a podcast I did with uh, Ninzio and Mark DeSantis of their practice, uh, the hospitality focus practice in Texas. And during COVID, you know, they, they only do hospitality work. Most practices, their recession proof strategy is diversification. Diversification is actually, it's not without its problems in terms of a strategy because it means that you're kind of lessening your oomph in one field you're spreading it across um it's less you know you you can't be as operationally efficient inside of the business when you're dealing with lots of different project typologies um but they were like no that went diversification that's not for us we're going to innovate and we're going to innovate with serving um, the hospitality industry whilst they're going through their hardest point ever. Whilst they have lost all of their clients, you know what's happening? All of the other architects have buggered off. They have said, your industry is dying. We're going to go and focus somewhere else, which left them a opportunity to be able to double down and innovate and come up with new services to help prepare those clients for what would happen with the inevitable end of the COVID uh, kind of lockdowns. And so during that period, they, they invented new services. They started networking. They started really getting deep into the world of, that, of their hospitality clients. And they deepened relationships. And they were able to pick up new clients that had been abandoned by their other architects, if you like, who had left them for dead. I'm being a bit extreme here, but you understand what we're... What, you know the the kind of image that uh, that's being painted, and again they were they were confident in their abilities to to market and to sell, and confident in their abilities to be able to serve that kind of uh, that kind of client. So, having peace of mind, we cannot underestimate what an enormous uh, resource that is in our ability to perpetuate what it is that we want. And that is is such an inspiring example, Ryan, of what I would call leadership. So leading your clients, this is an opportunity that, I mean, as, as Ryan and I discuss this here, Ryan and I, we can look at that with admiration, respect, acknowledgement, and certainly as, as you as the listener listen to this as well, how incredible that Nunzio um, was able to do this and his son, their partners in the business, um, be able to take that proactive approach. And here's the thing, clients are looking for leadership, meaning when, when this proverbial shit is hitting the fan, when everyone else is freaking out, when there's the skies falling, Everyone is looking for someone that has certainty or certitude. And you as a firm owner, you can demonstrate this. It's a beautiful opportunity to step into leadership and to say, hey, look, while the other firms are freaking out and they're just reacting to everything, we're confident. We know this is going to end and we want to align ourselves with other businesses who are believing that, again, this is an opportunity to prepare ourselves for the inevitable end of COVID. What a beautiful example. So, that goes along with our first principle here when we talk about these recession strategies. Number one is the economy always operates in cycles. So if we're not taking proactive steps right now to gain the skills, the attributes, the disciplines, and the tool sets to be able to thrive in the face of recession, then we're only diluting ourselves. We're like the proverbial ostrich that has its head buried in the sand. And trust me, I get it. It's, it's human and natural to do this. I recently sent out a little uh, email to the list and also a social media post giving an example about how about six months ago I did a CT scan and they found two spots in my lungs. Now, probably, probably just totally benign, no problem. But the doctor did recommend that I go in for a follow-up exam to see if there was more spots or see if these spots had grown. And what's interesting is you would think that I would have been on that immediately, like, oh, shoot, if I have lung cancer, I want to sue rather than later. But actually, my subconscious mind, I'll blame it on that, sabotaged me. And I was like, I didn't want to go in because if I did have lung cancer, as crazy as this sounds when I say it out loud, I look back and this is what happened, right? Because it's six months down the road and I was, there was a part of me that was worried about getting the bad news. So I was just thinking ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is bliss. Now, since that time, I, I have the CD sitting on my 
desk over here with the images from that scan. And within a week or two, I'm going to be scheduled in for the follow-up CT scan. And I'm sure everything will be just fine. But it's not too different from when times are good in architectural practice. Uh, and we know the fact. We know that there's going to be cycles in the economy. And yet we're not taking the time to build a house now before we actually need it. Dig our well now. You know, the old pro proverb again, the best, the best time to, to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is right now. Absolutely. Um, the next principle we're going to look at is poor salespeople and poor marketers. These are the guys that get spooked. These are the guys that get frightened in the economy. These are the ones that get paralyzed with fear. And run they run for the hills. They run for the hills and they stop selling. They stop um, doing business development. And in many cases, they weren't even doing business development in the, in the first place. So it doesn't take much for them to stop. Or they start in a really frantic manner, having never done it, having got no skill sets based in it. And they do it with an attitude of desperation, of neediness, of, uh, of kind of resignation. And they're already predestined to failure. Okay. The skilled ones, they double down on what they've already been doing. Right? They know which of these strategies work really, really well. They know their client. They've been, they've been marketing and selling consistently through the whole, all the good times. So very much echoing what you're saying there. And they're very clear on the pains and the problems of their clientele. They've, they're obsessed with their clients. They understand the financial cycles of their clients. They understand the pain problems of their clients. They understand what their clients are trying to accomplish. And when I say clients, I'm really focusing on the people with the money who are going to give you money to do a service for them, not just the stakeholders, which architects are very good at considering, and that's very important. But ultimately, it's the clients with the money that we want to be able to understand. And the better we can understand them as well, the better, the better projects that get delivered and built and the better that we can serve all sorts of other genders that are important to us. So the, the skilled marketers and salespeople, they double down when there is a dip and they know where to double down and they're ready. Yep, ab absolutely. Principle number three here is that poorly run businesses fail to communicate with teams, clients, and consultants and other stakeholders. So it's not uncommon. I can see this, I can see this uh, in my past life when I was running an architectural practice as an inexperienced leader, someone who just hung up my shingle was hoping for the best. Uh, you know, when projects got delayed, when things would happen at planning, uh, instead of being proactive and communicating with clients and letting them know immediately that maybe the timeline was changing or what was up, I was just like, oh, maybe I just won't tell them because it's going to be an uncomfortable conversation and maybe they won't notice, right? And so there's this, this natural part, at least that I found in myself, I mean, this happens too with conversations with my wife. Sometimes I may not want to deliver bad news. So these kind, this kind of thing is very common when business owners are running their business uh, in an unconscious state or they're not aware of their own leadership. And what ends up happening is they fail to communicate for whatever reason, out of fear, out of negligence out of just not being aware out of being stuck in the weeds of the business so they don't give other people a heads up about what's actually happening and what we found time and time again is clients are understanding consultants are understanding team members are understanding if you know how to frame it properly and if you're just upfront about what's happening everyone then can operate from a sense of at least they know what's happening it's sort of like you know when you're trapped in a room with the hornet you want to see where the hornet's at. The worst hornet's the one you can't see because mm. then you're nervous all the time. Whereas if you see it over there on the wall, you're good. It's like my wife and I, we were at a, this wonderful uh, Thai restaurant the other day on our on our weekly date night. And as we're sitting there enjoying some, some pho uh, and a little bit of sushi, they had sushi too, which was interesting. Uh, all of a sudden, a bee flies over my shoulder inside the restaurant and like kind of lands on the window right next to us and my wife is like freaking out oh my goodness there's a bee and uh but when we could see it no problem there's the bee right but all of a sudden she couldn't see the bee and then the terror the terror started to set in what's going to happen well fortunately the uh the restaurant to, to to draw the story to a close restaurant owner came over and quickly dispatched of the bee but the moral of the story is you want to be able to see where the threat is in your business. Be open with it to communicate that with team members in a proactive way, in a way that's going to build them up and not put them into fear, but in a way that's going to empower them and your team members.
Absolutely. And I think, you know, the, the, the businesses that do communicate with their clients, like with the example of uh, Nunzio and, and his son, you know, they found opportunities. They found opportunities to serve the clients in a new way. And so much of the stress that comes with, um, you know, a, any kind of economic contraction is the fear of, oh, my God, what are the clients going to think? What are other people going to think? Thinking that you're the only business that's going through a difficult time. And then if you do find other businesses that are going for a difficult time, then you just complain and you kind of console each other in misery and it doesn't actually do anything. Um, or you feel bad about what's happening financially, so you hide it from the team, like you like you were, you were saying, and that's only going to make things worse. Or you don't have the ability, you don't have the confidence to know how to be transparent with your team about what's happening financially. So, and again, a business that's um, that, that's poorly led, of course, they're going to be poor, poor in their communication because that will be in, that will be uh, prolific all the way through. So Ryan, let's jump over. We, we've covered we've covered the problems that are facing firms in a recession. We we took a look at the possibilities, what's possible when you use the strategies we're going to go over, and then we jumped into three very important principles. Let's jump over now to our strategies. So we have a list here of how many do we have? We have ten specific strategies. Uh, actually, when you count, we have a couple bonus strategies in here as well. But we're going to give you these strategies. Um, what to look at when you see that a recession's looming, when cash flow starts to dip, when you're in a cash flow crunch, which ultimately that's what we're talking about here because uh, you know, how, does, how does a recession affect a business? Well, uh, an architectural practice, at the end of the day, it comes down to uh, the cash flow. It just comes down to money. It comes down to finance. Uh, it may come down to the kind of projects you take on, but you know, we, we can all suffer through maybe picking up a couple of projects that may not be the most exciting or thrilling. But when the, when the funds dry up, this is when... Uh, we're entering into uh, very uh, stormy waters. Yeah, absolutely. So this is really the cash flow shortage. So the first one, very obvious, sell more, close more new deals, hustle, beat those bushes, hit the phone, set up lunches, breakfast meetings. Again, like we were saying earlier, those who have been doing the hard work and the diligent work of building pipeline, of prospecting, who have been you know, they've been earmarking time every single week to be making phone calls, phone calls developing those relationships. Then now all they got to do is double down on the things that they've already proven that work. They've, do they've gone through the hard uh, yard in the good times of establishing which of their strategies are the most effective. Now they can double down on them. Now is not the time to be trying to figure out how to market and sell. It's, right. Yeah, it's, it's hard to do that. And the, we do have a podcast episode with uh, MK Studio, one of the practices that we've been working with for a while in the Smart Practice Program. And one of the things that we teach in there is we call it the, 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 the two-a-day protocol. And the two-a-day protocol is simply reaching out to uh, contacts twice a day through phone, text, email, and just keeping that network alive. Now, it's one thing to know that we need to uh, build a network and meet with people to to be able to build a pipeline. Like no surprise there. None of you listening to this are probably falling over and you're saying, oh, this is the stroke of genius. These two brilliant uh, principles here at Business of Architecture have just enlightened me as to the way to win work. No, this is, we are under no illusions that this has happened. However, but it's it's an entirely different thing to be able to take those relationships and turn that into work because you need to know how to ask for the work. You need to know in the, what, the right timing to ask for the work. You need to know how to turn those relationships into the work. And that's where the skill comes into it. So that's strategy number one, Ryan, which is get out there, sell more, close more deals, focus bring on business development, work. focus on bringing in the work, like bring out your inner hustler, like the inner hustler has got to come out. It's like the inner hunter is going to go out into the forest and you got to bring home some game for the yep. team. Yeah, right. there should be an excitement around this one and a little bit of the fear of God as well. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> so number two is, and I, I'm a I like this one because we've seen it with our own clients work really, really effectively. Um, can be a lot of fun, can be very, very easy, which is actually, which is to start to collect payment for services up front. So there's a few ways that you can do this. One could be simply that the new clients that you're taking on, that you start taking bigger amounts of money up front. Okay, you start taking larger deposits, you start taking 50% um, deposits, you start taking 100%. Okay, so those of you who are doing small turnaround bits of bits of work, 
um, you know, that last maybe a month or two, then they should be paid up front 100% before you even start work on them. Just, okay, but that's, that's an easy no-brainer, okay? Or simply just starting to, new work comes in, you just take larger chunk to start with. The second part of this is actually incentivizing clients for upfront payments. So projects that you've already got on the books and have got and has been committed to, then it would be wise to consider how you might incentivize those clients to pay that money that they've already committed to paying you today as opposed to over the next 10 months. Now this is not going to be uh, you know, it's not going to be a fit for every single client that you have, obviously. Um, but one incentivization that you could use is simply to reduce the total amount that they're going to pay for your services by five or ten percent, and say basically it's like a sale. You know, if you pay, if you pay me tomorrow, the the uh, the, the remaining of the fee that we've committed to, we'll give it to you to five ten percent less. Okay, this is where discounting becomes very very useful. And it's very effective. We've seen plenty of strategies, plenty of clients who have used this. It's bought them two, three months worth of uh, worth of time. You know, they had a hundred thousand dollars worth of fees on a project, and they said, "Pay me that hundred thousand dollars in the next seven days." Well, you know, we're not ten percent off of it. Goes down to ninety grand, whatever. Uh, the client was in a position to be able to to do that. Fantastic. Buys the business three months. Those three months mean that there's three months of really good business development activities. Great problem of problem diverted. Exactly. And to be to be very very clear, we are we're only suggesting discounting at a at a at a last as a last as a very very last resort, right? Because too often architects, this is the first thing you may go to when you're looking to. Uh, to pr convince, persuade, to get some connection from your clients as to slash your fees. We do not recommend this. However, in the case of your bank account being drawn down, here's here's why this is important and why what Ryan's saying is so powerful. Not necessarily be, we're not so worried about the discount of the money, but an entrepreneur or a business owner or an architect who has $100,000 in their, in their operating expense account versus one that has $10,000 in their operating expense account. Let's say that their break even every month is fifty thousand dollars, right? So let's say that you have a hundred thousand versus ten thousand. So you have two months of operating expenses versus a fifth, twenty percent. This person is going to operate very, very differently. The person who's staring at a bank account balance of ten thousand dollars, not even enough to make payroll next week, is going to be operating out of scarcity. They're going to make rash decisions. They're not going to be operating out of their highest level of thinking versus someone that has that $100,000. What they've done is they've bought themselves some peace of mind. So they have the ability to regroup. They have the ability to approach the situation from a powerful state of mind as opposed to a place of scarcity. And that's that's the importance of this. So the money you get is not necessarily the most important thing because let's face it, you could cover a cash shortfall with financing or other opportunities like that. We, we'll talk about that later. But the actual mental switch that goes off in your mind when you're able to have that money in the bank account is is worth much more than the money itself. I, I Yeah, and I also think that it's not really a discount because this is a trade. Because you've lowered the well fee. Said, well said. You've actually yep. lowered the fee. And I, yeah, I know we use the word discount, but you've actually lowered the fee in exchange for something else, which is. It's a consent, yeah. Yeah. It's a trade. Know, you've brought, you, you pay me sooner. Yes, so indeed. You, yeah. you, so it's, you, yep. you make a saving. So, yep. you know, and yep. in, in, in anything like that, you know, it doesn't, it, it, you know, you don't even need to reduce the fees. You could offer something else. Exactly. And a bonus, an extra service, you know. Call me anytime. We're gonna put a, a team member on, you know, on on the project, you know, at your disposal, twenty four seven. I've got a house. I've I've got a I've got a spare room you can use anytime you visit. Whatever it is. That's yeah. right. We have a. You you I'll throw in my vacation home two weeks a year for you and your your wife to go stay at. You know, and we're assuming that as a small practice owner, you must have a vacation home. <laughs> so. But it, the, the point being that you can be creative here yes, with how yes. you in, how you incentivize your clients to to bring the payment structure forward, and you will be surprised at you know how this works and how mm -hmm. it actually is advan advantageous to many clients as well. You know, certainly if you're coming towards the end of the tax year, 
There is often a lot of clients who want to make an investment in their business and rather not pay it as tax. Uh, they can pay for you know the remaining as the remainder of your services, which is going to go on for the next few months. Makes sense for them to pay you all now. And the other thing here to be aware of that just came to mind, Ryan, is that you need to be aware that your clients will be trying to do the inverse to you. And so this goes into, I'm going to jump ahead, get ahead of ourselves a little bit. Number seven here that we're going to talk about is uh, negotiating or delaying payments to vendors. So typically what you'll see, and those of you who've been through recession before, you know what happens with larger institutional clients or clients that are they're battening down the hatches. Oftentimes, one of the first things they do is they're like, okay, well, let's slow down all of our payments to vendors. So you need to be aware that this is another uh, another threat out there that you may face, which is clients may sit on your invoice for a month or two longer. And so maybe part of the negotiation is just getting them to pay on time. So we need to be aware of that as well. All right, let's jump into strategies number three and four. Strategy number three is to collect on accounts receivable. So all that outstanding money, the invoices that you've let sit, uh, that you haven't followed up on because you're too busy doing other things, make sure you, you you hustle that. You know, If you're not a hustler or you don't like badgering clients, hire someone to do that that has that kind of personality, right? Every practice that has a low amounts of accounts receivable, they have someone on the team who's not afraid to have a direct conversation to call someone up and say, hey, where's our money? You know, this, this, yes, I like you, we're friends, and this is business. And, you know, if I'm your friend, why are you not paying me? In other words, right? Turn it back on the client. So that's strategy number three. Strategy number four is to accelerate your invoicing cycle. So issue invoices twice per month. Now, preferably, you're getting paid in advance for your work. So to clarify what Ryan said previously, when we talk about getting paid in advance, we're not just talking about collecting a retainer. We're talking about literally you get paid before the month begins. So the month, the work that you're going to be doing that month, you have the cash in the bank at the you know before the month actually starts. Now, for some clients, that won't be possible. They're not going to be flexible in their payment terms, that's fine. And you may have agreed to different payment terms and you're not in the position to renegotiate that. Then you can accelerate the invoicing cycle, issue the invoices twice per month. And this can allow you to free up that cash flow and make sure that you're maybe avoiding some of the dips. Because what typically happens with cash flow in a practice is that because the payroll happens twice a month and yet um, your invoices maybe come in in a lump sum at a particular time, you may have a particular day in the month where it drops down very, very low. And so as a preventative strategy, if you're bringing that money twice per month, you can soften that and make sure that you don't go into the negative. Uh, so it, that's our strategy number four. Interesting with that one. I mean, sometimes I hear people who are very hesitant to bill up front for work and they really want to have finished the work before they bill. You know, and sometimes we use a thought experiment of, well, imagine, you know, what a great scenario it would be if you let's, you, let's say that you got your fees bang on right, for first, first of all, and the client paid you 100% of that fee from the beginning. Now, why would that be a problem? Okay, okay. some people might be worried that, um, you know, they might spend all the money too quickly. All right, if that's a problem, there's methods and strategies to drip feed yourself that, that money. But also, it's businesses that don't know what to do with money. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, they get nervous of doing mm -hmm. that. It's businesses that are uncomfortable having money that don't like to have money in quicker. Yes, yes, right? yes. And, and, I, and I would really point the question back, the finger back of being like, are you a good steward of, of money? Because if you're a good yes. steward of money and you know where money needs to be deployed for to help improve your business, to grow, to you know, make sure that you retain a talent to make sure that you keep your own mental health and your best quality, then that is going to massively benefit your clients. Okay. If you're not a good steward of money, then you're going to be worried about having money too quick. So number five, reduce operating expenses. All right. So start turning your machine into a lean creature. First thing that you'd suggest for you to get rid of, cut any fringe expenses. So this is lunches, this is work drinks, this is entertainment, this is the Friday night, uh, you know, kind of band that plays in the office or whatever kinds of uh, things that you might be indulging in. Probably could do without that for a bit. All right. I know I've seen businesses in the past and they, you know, they've gone into difficult cash flow problems and they insist on keeping these things with the argument that they're they're keeping up team morale 
And again, I would sort of, I would kind of point to that your communication with people is what generates morale, not free drinks. Okay. And if you're leaning into you're trying to buy people's favor, then that's a, a kind of deeper issue. But cut fringe expenses, things that are unnecessary, um, free coffee, all that sort of stuff, get rid of it. Reduce employee hours and salaries. So we start to furlough people. Um, again, as a small practice, I, th I think just having a lot of people, having a good base of people who are contract staff anyway is a very sound strategy so that you can only be paying people for when they're needed. And this helps your business kind of contract and expand with, uh, with, with, your, work, with your work flow. Um, but if you've got people who are permanently employed of you, then negotiations can begin to, for them to protect and maintain them as, as team members and actually start reducing their, you know, how many days they're working per week, reduce their salaries. There can be people who can put themselves voluntarily up for that. Uh, and you can negotiate all of these things, exactly like what happened during COVID. Okay. And again, it can be very beneficial to both parties involved. Third is actually letting go of people. So this is never an easy thing to do. However, you may see that this is the opportunity to let go of underperforming team members. Um, perhaps there are, there are kind of contract staff members and these people, you just can put a pause on those contracts altogether. Um, certainly, if you've got people who have been toxic or toxic to the culture or you've deemed not to be a fit and you've been in your own head about whether I should get rid of them or I shouldn't, now's a great time to take the action and cull back okay prune do some pruning in the business get the machine uh very lean and then finally business development marketing improving the business um consultants that you might be working with that are helping you build and grow the business your communications experts that you're working with these should be the last expenses that you cut and this is again something that we see happens all the time. The first thing that gets cut is say something like marketing. When there's a bit of a recession or an economic downturn, you need to be marketing more when mm -hmm. there is One of the this worst mistakes change. ever. Yeah. And then of course, yep. what happens is you cut back all your marketing. You decide to put uh, a very junior person onto your marketing activities. Goodbye pipeline. That's right. It's like, and, I'm starving, so I'm going to cut off the best source of food that I have. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's like how to, how to compound the, how to compound the, 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 the effect, problem. the problem. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, so num number six, Ryan, go for it. Number six, delay capital purchases. So, you know, big investments that you were looking at making in the business, like perhaps a whole lot of new computers or desks or software upgrades. Um, perhaps you're looking at doing a load of building work to the office or buying the new office or you're buying vehicles. These sorts of big expenditures, these can just be put on pause. Yes, yes, brilliant, brilliant. All right, so numbers, strategies number seven and eight, and these are in no particular order. As a matter of fact, under number five, we have reduced operating expenses, laying off staff, marketing. Those, those should be some of the last things to do. Um, so don't don't take this necessarily as like as the right. It's going to be very uh, situational how you implement these strategies. All right. So number seven is to negotiate or delay payments to vendors. So this is what we talked about, referenced earlier, which is uh, you know you have some chats with your consultants, have some chats with your vendors. Are there any bills that you can delay? Uh, can you can you you know put off paying them for a month to be able to, to get some extra cash into the business. Number eight, which is a great one, is get financing or credit, but make sure that you're not running the business irresponsibly off of financing or credit. For instance, getting financing or credit to keep staff on board when the business can't afford it. Uh, every successful entrepreneur that I know, when the business isn't performing, they, they make sure they get paid as the business owner. If the business can't support the staff, the staff get laid off. That's just, that's just the A plus B of 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 running a business right mm -hmm. so this is why it's so incumbent to make sure that you're you have the skill to do business development so you never get in the position of having to lay off a valued team member right now not to say that at sometimes you might not want to invest in staff by keeping them on even if you're having to supplement uh, the business a little bit all right 
So that's number six and eight. Number six, delay capital purchase. Well, that's what Ryan said. Seven, negotiate or delay payments to vendors. Number eight, get financing or credit. And then Ryan, why don't you wrap us up with numbers nine and 10? Uh, just before I do that, number seven, yep. the negotiate yep. delay payments. One thing I would say about that is that you get clear agreements with vendors on what Indeed. that looks like. Like you get on, you jump on the yep. phone, don't do this with wimpy emails, really no. getting fed up of hiding, like, disappearing. Yeah. People negotiating all sorts of stuff and emails. Don't be surprised. That's when terrible. All, yeah, when it that's terrible. Blows back in your face. Just, that's just, well, that, that's, that's the other thing too, right? About this is like, there's, there's, there's the karma, right? So if, if you're doing this to other people, I mean, how can you expect when the universe people do it back to you? They just go radio silent. They're not paying you. They're avoiding your phone calls. You need to stand for your own level of integrity. So yes, thanks for pointing that out. Absolutely. And, and you know, and get, get clear agreements with your vendors, dates, numbers, you know, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to suggest. If you say, I can't pay you, uh, I don't know when I'm going to be able to pay you next. Okay. That doesn't really work. There needs to be some, at least some structure of communication. So you say, I don't know when I'm going to better pay you, but I am going to be, I'm going to report back to you. We're going to have another conversation in two days time. And in two days time, I'm going to be able to tell you when I'm, when I can confirm when you'll receive your payment. Yes. Yeah, so I'll give you okay? a status update. Exactly. Yeah. But you've got to get something in. If you, if you go nebulous with any of this, then it's, it's it lacks integrity. So the final two is to sell assets. So Maybe, you know, there's computers that you're not using. We were joking. The Aston them. Martin. The, the Aston the, Martin the, car. The fine, the, fine, the fine collectible art piece in the office. <laughs> I, I put this question to uh, some, a group of architects the other day of, uh, you know, what assets could you sell? And somebody said pets and children. So, <laughs> obviously in jest. Obviously in jest. Yes, yes. Right. But, but things like vehicles, furniture. I, I mean, I see so many architects with big, enormous offices that are empty, just kind of waiting for them to be filled, just flipping rent out some of the office space. Mm -hmm. If you've got yep. it, like, what well, was a yep. no brainer, easy. Um, com computers, you could even think about loaning team members out to other practices. So excellent, actually, excellent so, strategy. So actually loaning a team member out and having somebody else pay you to be able to use your team member if you haven't got enough work. Um, I think that can work very well. And then finally, number 10, actually just, you know, being like an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur and raising money from outside investment. Okay. So actually there could be contractors or developers who want to have a little piece of your business who you've been working with for a long period of time. There's been a really good syner uh, synergy there. Perhaps you've been talking about it of kind of collaborating more deeply. All right. Well, now could be a time where, you actually raise some money for them to invest into your business, for them to take a little bit of, uh, perhaps they take a bit of a stake or perhaps there's a different arrangement that you have um, where you might give them a kind of share of profits later on. Whatever it is, you can get super creative with this, but this would be a very uh, a, a good way of, you know, getting more capital in the, in the business. There might be consultants that you've worked with in the past who might be interested in investing into your business. Perhaps you've worked with business consultants who know your business very intimately and they might be interested in, you know, investing and taking a stake of your company. They might even give you in exchange more uh, strategies for business development and for business growth. And it could be a win-win scenario for both of you, or it could be past clients who again, who know and have a very good relationship with you. They've been interested in the, in the design world. They understand uh, business. Perhaps they've got a big network of their own of high net worth individuals, let's say. Um, and they know that they could uh, market your business to an existing network and existing relationships that they have. And it would make sense for them to be able to invest some capital and, in, and get some ownership in your business. Or again, whatever arrangement you, you have with them, they'll, they'll be interested. They'd be motivated to, introduce you to these team members to these uh to their network great yeah i i had just on this i had a, a personal friend of mine recently uh, a couple months ago reached out to me he's a dentist he's been investing heavily in his practice he's making uh he invests in some very expensive equipment and he was just suffering a cash flow shortage like he was trying to refinance some of his debt and so he reached out to me and said hey enoch can uh can i uh, can you will you loan me a hundred thousand dollars to be able to refinance some of my debt 
you know? And he said, I'm going to pay it back at a very, a very reasonable interest rate. I'll give you 12%. I can't remember the exact number, but I wasn't in a position to lend that money to him at the time, but I did appreciate the fact that he reached out because he's my friend. Uh, it's favorable terms to me. And certainly if I would have had that money to be able to give to him, and I did consider it, I considered maybe liquidating some investments to, to help him out, but this is not, so it's not completely outside of, of reason to be able to do this with someone. Yeah. Now, we're going to just quickly, there you have it. We have our 10 specific strategies uh, to, that will help you out in a recession. One strategy we haven't mentioned, which is essential, is make sure you're filling out your 13-week cash flow projection. So 13 weeks is a quarter. It's three months. And make sure you're having this filled out by your bookkeeper or an office manager or yourself every single week, even when times are good. All right. So if you go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash 13, that's the number 13, one, three week. So no spaces in that. You can get access to a spreadsheet with instructions. And it also has the list of these 10 different strategies that we talked about. So it's businessofarchitecture.com forward slash 13 week. Now to review, the strategies are these. Sell more, close more deals, number one. Number two, collect payment for services up front. Number three, collect on accounts receivable. Number four, accelerate the invoicing cycle. Number five, reduce operating expenses. Number six, delay capital purchases. Number seven, negotiate or delay payments to vendors. Number eight, get financing or credit. Number nine, sell assets. Number 10, raise money for investors. Now, certainly there are more strategies than these. And if you want to make sure you are prepared for a recession or market downturn to thrive, of course, come enroll in the Smart Practice Program and become one of more than 200 architecture firm owners that are running their practice with a system that allows them to be prepared while other firm owners are panicking. And that's a wrap. Oh yeah, one more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step -step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.